All right, folks, welcome. We are so excited that you're here. Um, Kate is going to pull up our presentation in just a few minutes, and it is my um, pleasure to introduce her in the meantime. So give us just a few more seconds and we'll get started. And while Kate pulls that up, uh, my name is Maria Kriboruchko. I am a 2011 graduate of UCLA. I was uh, at the Daily Bruin, the arts and entertainment editor and prime editor while I was there. And currently I serve at the Daily Bruin Alumni Network as the mentoring committee chair. So it is my absolute pleasure to introduce Kate Parkinson Morgan. She graduated in the class of 2014 and she was um, the blog editor and the first digital managing editor. I wanted to make sure I got that correct. And currently, Kate is a podcast producer. She works as a senior producer at Pushkin Industries, which is Malcolm Gladwell's podcast company. Previously, she worked at Gimlet, which is now under Spotify, on shows including Crime Town, The Cut from New York Magazine, and The Nod, which she's going to reference a little later, and which was also adapted into a TV show. She started her career at Morning Edition at the NPR headquarters in D.C., and also helped launch NPR's music's uh, first Tiny Desk Concert Contest, which I absolutely love. So thank you, Kate, so much for being here. And we are really excited to learn about Podcasting 101 with you. Awesome. Thank you guys for having me. I think I'm unmuted. Yes, Maria? Yeah, great. Awesome. Um, it's great to be here. I don't have Kirkhoff as my background, but uh, Maria reminded me of what it was like to be in that building and be eating lots of Panda Express and drinking too much coffee. Um, I'm really excited to share uh, with you guys today all about podcasting and basically like a podcasting 101, a primer of what it's like to uh, start a podcast from scratch, uh, from starting from the basics. So I graduated in 2014, like Maria said. Um, I was our digital managing editor, so I actually was in charge of uh, online and radio, but I never made any of my own radio pieces while I was at the Daily Bruin, which was very sad. Um, I only came to that uh, later when I... Uh, joined Gimlet, which is uh, now under Spotify, but uh, is a podcasting company, used to be a very, very small podcasting company before it was owned by Spotify. So I've worked on a lot of podcasts. Um, I think I was calculating for this that I've, I worked on weekly shows. So basically a show every week for the past seven years. And then when I was in a uh, news, it was like every single day. So I think I was calculating like almost 300 podcasts or something like that. So um, this is a selection of the podcasts I've worked on. The one that I feel the most affinity and love for is The Nod. It's a podcast about Black culture launched, I think in 2017, um, ended about a year ago and became a TV show very briefly. So that was awesome. Um, but uh, yeah, this is, these are just some of the shows that I've worked on and I'm going to share some stories from the uh, from working on these shows, but um, I'm a senior producer. And what that means is I do all sorts of things. I write scripts. I work with hosts like Brittany and Eric, who are the hosts of The Nod to kind of work with them on writing, on vo voice coaching. I cut tape. So the audio that comes through when we do interviews, I put together the episode. I do kind of scoring and sound design. So all of the music um, producer in podcasting means so many things and you wear so many hats and I'm helpful. I'm, I'm uh, definitely down to talk more about what that means and in, in podcasting. Uh, we'll have a Q&A at the end. And just so you guys know, um, if you have questions, I will answer that at the end of this presentation. And I think we will send out uh, at least some of these slides later. So don't worry. Um, just enjoy the show. Um, also, I will probably say some confusing jargon like tape, meaning like just audio. And uh, again, you can ask me questions about that at the end. Uh, hopefully it won't be too confusing though. Um, so I wanted to start with this uh, quote from, I think a lot of people know who Ira Glass is. He founded This American Life, very popular radio show turned podcast. Um, and he has this great quote that I remember, I actually think I read it when I was at the Daily Bruin, and he's talking about taste and doing creative work and how basically when you're making something for the first time, your taste is better than what you're actually making. And it really like struck a chord 
with me because I feel like I always have such lofty goals of, of making things. And, and um, when you're first making a thing, like if you're starting out in podcasting, the first couple of things you're making just aren't going to reach your taste level. Um, and I think it's always good to keep in mind, like, you just have to make stuff for a long time. So he has said this quote about creative work and your taste is amazing, but it's always disappointing you. But you need to get beyond that basically and just make the thing and eventually your taste and your work will kind of align. So even though this presentation will be a lot about how many things you have to think about before even starting a podcast and it's going to seem like a lot, like it's not just a dude, you know, sitting at a microphone recording and then putting something out. Um, it's important to realize that you'll get to the place where a lot of these things would become second nature and, and your taste will align. So I just really like this quote and I remember it striking a accord with me when I read it ages ago when I was not even in podcasting. Um, and one final thing about this, uh, what's great about podcasting is like I said, you can make something so, I mean, not easily, I would say working in podcasting, everyone thinks it's easy, but you can iterate and make a ton of different podcasts versus if you're creative and you're trying to make a movie, it might take forever to make it. So um, with create, this type of creative work, it's amazing because you can just keep at it and eventually maybe 300 podcasts in, you find something or you make something that you're really proud of. Um, so today I'm just going to be going over basically the steps of making a podcast one by one, starting with development, then podcast production, editing and promotion. And I'm kind of going to focus a lot more on development and production. I also do a lot of editing. Actually, part of my title of, of senior producer is editing. And I'll get into what that really means because it's not just kind of going in and in the software and cutting the tape. It's sort of being a big picture story editor. Um, but for the purposes of this, I just want to talk a little bit more about development and production, mostly development, because I actually think that that's where like the best podcasts are made is when you do a lot of thinking and pre-planning and preparation um, to make the thing. I think like the best podcasts are just like incredibly well prepared. And of course I would think that because I'm a producer um, and I am all about the preparation. Um, so today, basically, we're going to learn how to develop a podcast idea, plan and prepare an episode, edit that episode, which is really, really important, just as important as recording, and uh, promote the show beyond just sort of putting a link out on Twitter and hoping that the podcast gods will hear you and make your show a number one on Apple Podcasts. Um, so starting with development. Uh, I think one of the top questions you want to ask yourself is why a podcast? Why are you thinking of making a show into a podcast? Why not a TV show? Why not a, a movie? There's so many other uh, formats you could use to get across an idea. What is it about podcasting? So we'll get a little bit more into that, like why I think some certain things lend themselves more to podcasting than other um, genres. Um, we're going to ask like, okay, how do you create a show identity um, at the development phase? So thinking about format, thinking about tone, thinking about style, not just thinking about topic, not just going like, I want to make a podcast about pumpkin spice lattes. Well, like, okay, are you going to play a game where people have to taste 10 different types of pumpkin spice lattes? What's the, what's the format? What's the structure it's taking place in? And then how much time do you have? Time is a big one in podcasting. Everyone always thinks that it's like super easy to make a podcast. It just takes an hour and then you put it out on the feed. But I'm going to argue that actually it is a good chunk of time if you want to make a good one. And then most importantly, you know, at the development phase, thinking a lot about what your audience needs. Um, what is it that, what's the niche you are fill, filling right now? Like there might be people uh, who are like, okay, there's a lot of shows about, um, I don't know, Starbucks coffee, but there aren't any about pumpkin spice lattes. So uh, I think I'm going to focus in on this one specific niche because I think people will be really interested about that. Um, building the show around an audience need and thinking about like, who are people in my target audience that I'm trying to reach? Not just like, it would be fun to make a show about X, Y, Z. Well, why? Who is it serving? Um, so this sounds really aggressive having this graphic of this like man podcasting, but I think I'm using it basically to be like, 
podcasting is not just a guy sitting in front of a laptop uh, talking for hours and uh, putting out a hit show. Joe Rogan has done that. Um, that is very true. There are people who do that, but I actually think the most interesting podcasts, in my opinion, not to hate on Joe Rogan, he does very well at what he does, but I think the most interesting podcasts play to the format more specifically. So um, I think one of the best things about audio is that it's very intimate. Someone's talking in your ear as you're you know, doing your laundry or going for a walk with your dog. Um, it's very intimate having someone, you know, in your ear talking to you. It's not as removed as seeing someone, you know, on screen. Um, you're just listening to their voice and you're creating a visual of who they are. And oftentimes they're accompanying you when you're doing very personal things. So I think there's something really nice about thinking and trying to reach this person uh, while they are, you know, you know, very focused and doing something personal and can reflect a little bit. So um, a show that I'm working on right now at Pushkin, which is my current company, um, I'm piloting a show about sex and sexuality. Um, and uh, it's a very intimate topic. And I think we're thinking, oh, well, it's going to be amazing as a podcast. It already exists as a book. Um, the host we're working with already has a book. But it's so nice to be able to think about listeners listening to a show about sex and sexuality, which is so intimate and by having her in their ear. Um, it's this more immediate thing. Um, uh, also, you should make a podcast if you're thinking about format as much as topics. So we could have gone, we want to make a show about sex and sexuality. And that's so broad, like it could be anything. But as we're piloting the show, we're like, okay, well, what's the format for it? And we're thinking it might be an advice show. We might mix up some, you know, get a game show in there too. We're like piloting it right now. So we're sort of experimenting a lot. Um, but I think trying different formats, not just having a two-way, what we call a two-way. So just somebody interviewing someone else. So Joe Rogan interviewing Obama or Bernie Sanders or whatever. Um, thinking about just like fun ways to make it exciting because you can do so much in audio. It doesn't require as much sort of production as a TV or anything like that. Um, and then you should make a podcast if you have time to prep and edit your episodes. So again, um, I'll talk about this later, but you really want to go in feeling like you're prepared, you have a plan, um, and that's going to basically make for the best podcast is not just doing stuff on the fly. There's always should be room for like a little bit of stuff on the fly that creates some magic, but like planning and a little bit of spontaneity. And then again, you're thinking about the audience and their needs. You're not just thinking, oh, it'd be fun to get my buddies together to talk about X, Y, Z. You're thinking, you know, there's a lot of people out there who like, for example, when we were, when we we're piloting the show, like we listened to a lot of, um, podcasts about sex and we were like a lot of them aren't very funny or um you know they're not as goofy as we want them to be because sex can sometimes be sort of funny and goofy and it's not all super serious and sexy all the time so the show we're making is slightly goofier and it's a little bit more scientific so thinking about okay we're trying to reach an audience of maybe you know women uh of a certain age who want to talk about sex or think about sex in a way that's slightly goofier and not so like sexy cosmo tips so um, these are some things that we are thinking about when we were like, okay, this should be a podcast because of these reasons. Um, and then as I'm working on this show right now, we're thinking a lot about show identity and it's making me think a lot about the work that I did on The Nod when I was first developing that show. So that's a show with Gimlet. It's a show that celebrates black culture and the joy of black culture and its history and, um, when we were developing that show, I was working with the hosts, Brittany Luce and Eric Eddings. It's an amazing show. I highly recommend you guys go and subscribe. It's no longer running, but they actually launched a different show called For Colored Nerds that's coming out this November. And I highly recommend that. I can always drop the link to that later. Um, but when we were thinking about developing this show, we were like, okay, we wanna listen to other shows in the space and figure out where the nod fits in, what's the, what's the kind of style and format and how is it gonna stand out? Um, and we sort of thought, okay, well, there's lots of shows out there that are very like critical and highbrow, but there aren't that many shows that are a mix of the two um, that bring joy and kind of talk about silly things like Nicki Minaj, but also talk about very serious things. So um, we were thinking about that a lot when we were making the show. And uh, we made a trailer that we felt like reflected that. So that's an exercise that I recommend 
when you're thinking about making a show, just make a mock trailer. It doesn't even have to be real. And just think about the tone and style of the show. So I'll play you actually a little bit of the nods, um, the nods trailer that actually uh, we ended up with. From Gimlet Media, this is The Nod. I'm Eric. And I'm Brittany. We're lifelong friends. And for as long as we can remember, we have been obsessed with the stories and the people who define what it means to be Black. That's Black with a capital B. We are Blackness's biggest fans. And on this show, we're going to explore the stories about Blackness that you don't often hear. Excuse me, do you carry grape drink? No, we carry only juice, grape juice. The juice is not going to work, though, right? I, I, I got to see. I got to see. I got to verify. I was like, I am Dorothy. <laughs> Do you even? <laughs> I'm going to ease on down this road, and you're going to follow me. So I would have, like, a white do-rag, a red headband, red wristbands, and red... Ed- so that's just... Like, From Gimlet ooh, Media? Sorry. Ooh. Okay. Um, that's just a little selection of the trailer, but you sort of get the feel for, like... It's a fun show. It's a show with a lot of joy in it. You have that tagline, we're Blackness's biggest fans. Um, and that really guided us as we were making the show. We were like, this episode, like this idea that we're pitching, uh, does it does it represent the idea of like Blackness's biggest fans? Or like, um, you know, does it reflect the ethos that we came up with when we were sort of thinking of the show identity and developing the show? Um, so there's some other ideas in here too. You can mock up a logo. Sometimes people are visual and you can think, okay, well, what's what do I want it to look like? And from there you can go, actually, I think we're doing a more serious show rather than a more joyful show. Excuse me. Um, you can make a sizzle, sizzle reel, which is kind of like a trailer, but maybe has just little selections of interviews you've done and play that you know, for your friends, do a pilot episode. So do a first draft of an episode, send it around to your friends, see what they have to think about it and see if it actually reflects the tone and the style that you were going for. So these are just a few exercises to think about. Also, um, something else I've done is uh, do like, a, this is very deep cuts, but write up a little creative brief of like your dream guests. Like one day if the podcast were to get really big, who would be like your ideal guests? And that can also help inform what type of show you're looking to make. Um, and again, going back to formats and playing with formats, which I think is like, the thing that no one talks about in podcasting. I think everyone thinks it's just someone interviewing another expert about X, Y, and Z, or, you know, it's a really highly produced This American Life or Radio Lab episode. And uh, you're hearing boop, 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 like all these different voices and it's super highly produced. I mean, that's great too, but I think there's space for so much, so many other interesting formats uh, in, in this space. So um, these are just some of the types of formats you could think about doing. So on the nod, we actually did a bunch of different formats and we experimented and it was sort of rare for podcasting. Usually I think a lot of podcasts stick to one or two formats, but we tried round table discussion. We did live shows. Um, we did some reporting in the field. Uh, we would do interviews really frequently. We did sort of a game show. Um, we had them do this thing called peanut butter history where one of the hosts would tell the story of someone from uh, history, a black person from history who sort of was little, little known and they would sort of have to tell the story of that person. I think in under like five or six minutes and while they were doing it, they had to eat peanut butter. Um, just really goofy stuff. I mean, we, we scrapped the peanut butter because we got people telling us that they hated uh, listening to people chewing on peanut butter, which is very valid. See, like you try something and then you try something. Next episode, you have 200 episodes to get it right. Um, but we really experimented with formats and I recommend uh, thinking about, you know, what's something outside of just interviewing an expert that you could try. Um, and then, like I said, podcasts take time and they also, uh, your listeners are expecting some consistency. They, you wanna set up expectations for them. So you wanna know going in, how much time do you have? What type of show you're gonna make is also gonna depend on how much time you have. So think about how long you want your episodes to be. Is it 10 minutes? Is it 20 minutes? Can you put it out every week for a year or do you wanna do something more seasonal? Um, can you even put it out every week? Is it once a month? I mean, in podcasting, a lot of what it's leaning towards is more of a weekly basis, even if it's not going on for an entire year. I think a lot of what people say is you wanna establish that routine, that consistency of like 
great, I'm doing my laundry on a Tuesday and I'm going to listen to this show. So a show that I worked on uh, with Gimlet and New York Magazine called The Cut on Tuesdays. It was a show basically, it's hard to explain, but it's like a, you know, The Cut is a, a women's vertical under New York Magazine. And it was sort of the podcast version of that. And they literally called it The Cut on Tuesdays. So people would be like, okay, every Tuesday, I know to expect a new episode from the cut. So it was like built into the name, which is really pretty, pretty awesome, actually. Um, so uh, another way of thinking about this that I really love is if you get really bummed out and you're like, oh, but like, I really want to make an hour long episode. You know, that's really the thing I want to make. It's like, okay, well, maybe you want to do something more seasonal, but also maybe you want to think about like, maybe I can make an hour long, deeply reported episode once a year. Um, at the nod, it ended up being, yeah, like once or twice a year and we have a whole team. It takes a lot of time to make those types of shows. And that episode would be called like a red episode. This is what we called them. It's like green, yellow, red, sort of like traffic lights. And a red was, this is going to take a really long time to report, but we're going to do it once a year. So I did this reporting on this woman who was making her own robot um, that was supposed to represent her sort of maternal line and I that took me so long it took me like a year and a half and it was so great but it was not something we could do every single week um a yellow episode would be like maybe we're talking to like three or four different people and putting that together with some narration and and uh we can do that but it takes a little bit of time and a green episode is maybe Eric who's a host and Brittany who's the other host are just talking about their favorite movie like they're talking about Friday or something and we we can cut that together super quickly that's green and we sort of know every week we can at least depend on that for putting that out so you want to have an idea of like what's the greenest version of this show that I could you know actually put out every single week that's really important to think about because you don't want to put out something and, and set expectations for your listeners and then sort of not deliver the next week I think you can be different every week I think listeners are open to that it doesn't have to be the same thing every week but consistency actually putting something out down a feed that's that's even bigger and so start simple and then just iterate and and get more comfortable um like I was saying a lot of people <laughs> in professional production houses. So, uh, you know, like Pushkin where I work or at Gimlet or um, similar companies of, of that size. Uh, I think we're a company of 50 or 60 people now. This photo is actually from our, um, our staff retreat this past fall. We all had to get COVID tested. It was very COVID safe. It was in upstate New York. It was really beautiful. Um, but there are a ton of people, as you can see in this photo, involved in putting out and making podcasts. So off to the left here, I have sort of a list of these are this is a whole list of people who can be involved in one show. And on a show like a radio lab or this American life, you have maybe like 10 producers and maybe three managing producers. So it's like double, triple this. Um, there's a lot of people involved at various different stages. Um, an editor is one position that I think a lot of people don't really know about. It's someone who comes in as a story editor and listens to the episode cold and sort of isn't as close to the work and gives advice about how to approach and structure the episode and make it stronger. Um, and I can answer questions about sort of the rest of these roles at the end if you have questions specifically about each role. But this is just sort of a reminder that if you're trying to make a podcast and you sort of are listening to like the This American Lives and the Radio Labs and you're like, I want to make something like that, just keep in mind that there's so many people behind these and, and, and don't sort of compare yourself to that unless you are trying to start the next podcasting startup and you have the funds to hire a million of these people, in which case you should talk to me because I would love to hear about it. Um, so going back to kind of this final question when you're developing that I was talking about, what does my audience uh, need? Again, you're not trying to be the next Ira Glass or um, Anna Sale, who does this great show called Death, Sex, and Money that I really loved back when I was in college, or Joe Rogan. Um, you want to play with format and tone, and you want to sort of find a new audience, ideally, and also think about who is already part of your audience and, and how can you build on that audience. So if you're trying to make a podcast about pottery and you're a potter, maybe you already know where some of that audience lives and how can you, how can you build on that and how can you create a new audience? Um, so uh, an example of a show that I think is really fun and very what we call like low lift in podcasting and that like 
definitely some production work goes into it, but it's, it's a, it's just a really great concept. It's a great format and it's infinitely repeatable and fun and surprising every time. It's called 10 Things That Scare Me. It's from WNYC Studios, which I realize I've shared a lot of um, podcasts from today. Uh, I really like what they do. They're really good at what they do. Um, and basically the premise of the podcast is anyone, it could be a celebrity, it could just be a random Joe Schmo, comes on the show and they just list off there's no introduction. They just list off 10 things that scare them. And I think it's so fun because, and I'll play you, I'll play you a little bit of it, but it's so fun because it's like podcasts are great for that, like intimacy and that connection. And what I liked about it as an audience and why I became like a sort of repeating audience member and I would come back for more is I just feel like it's nice, you know, podcasting has that level of like connection and intimacy where you're like, oh yeah, that also scares me. Um, you know, and like I, it was just fun to listen to every week and there was like always a mix of humor and sort of seriousness and the the guests changed every week um I just thought it was fun and it was really brief it was like less than 10 minutes so uh it's a great example of something that doesn't take a ton of time to make but can have a lot of impact so I'll just play you a little bit um this was an interview with Tobin Lowe who most people don't know he's actually a guy from the podcasting industry he produced a show called um Nancy which was sort of all about like being gay and um uh, sort of, yeah, the LGBT community. Um, and it's really great. It's no longer on the air, but I recommend listening to that too. It's called, again, Nancy. But um, he was interviewed about the 10 things that scare him. And this was his number six. Oh, if it'll play. It's not looking like it wants to play for me. Oh, okay. Well, I'll skip to the next slide. I don't know why this isn't playing for this one. Um, but basically he lists off like bros scare me or like um, being, he was like, you know, not being seen as mediocre scares me. And they have this great um, sound design underneath it. When sound design is like sort of just uh, an atmosphere or like a ambi, uh, I'm using all these jar all this jargon, like a ambient, sound and there's sort of the sound of like a fair or clowns and that was something else that was really cool about it is they just like played with sound in this really interesting way um so unfortunately i can't play this but i'll i can always drop a link to this podcast too at the end but uh, it's just a great a great show that i think plays with format in an awesome way um Okay, so we've gotten through development. Um, that took like most of uh, most of our time. Again, I think it's all like great podcasts come from a lot of thinking at the development phase about what you want to make. You're ready to record. Um, so even before you record, you want to think about uh, doing some prep. So doing some background research on your subject or on your guest uh, who you're talking to. Um, if you're doing narration or sort of preparing to kind of do a monologue, or even if you're doing like a round table discussion with friends, sort of come in with bullet points of where you think you're going in the conversation. I think a lot of people think it's just like off the top of the noggin, like, oh, get everyone in a room and see where it goes. Again, there's some spontaneity to it, but most podcasts you listen to are highly, highly prepped. Um, and people come in with sort of an arc. So how they want the episode to go, what are the different beats um, of the interview or of the discussion, where do they want it to land? So um, to the right here, there's this document that we use in Pushkin to prep for uh, interviews, to prep for even just like a really casual conversation where you want to talk about what's like the big idea behind the episode, where is it leading? Like, are we um, talking about, are we trying to end in a place where you're trying to argue that pumpkin spice lattes are like the worst thing in the world that's ever been invented or the best thing in the world? I don't know. Um, but like you, the conversation isn't just going off the rails, it's headed somewhere. Um, so it's really helpful just to sort of bullet out these things and come in with a plan and have this to reference. And you can always sort of go off the rails a little bit and, and um, but you know where you're, you know where you're ending up. Um, again, this is a lot of writing, but I am happy to send this slide at the very end. A lot of people have questions about technology to use. 
Um, to me, that's like the least important question, at least at this stage when you're starting out, because um, you can use something as simple as your iPhone or your laptop to record. iPhone actually has pretty great quality. I've recorded stuff for um, professional podcasts that you know engineers who've worked on it have filtered and made better but i've sent in an iphone recording and it's made it onto you know onto a show we've we've all been kind of uh doing stuff on the fly with uh with COVID for the past year because people can't be in studios anymore so it's kind of nice it means that the expectations have lowered a little bit um and for software like the lowest level of software you can use is this app called audacity um, you can even use GarageBand, and I've heard you can edit an iPhone. Kind of hard to probably do that on a little screen. I know it would be hard for me. I can barely edit on like a laptop when I'm editing audio, but um, these are just some options you could work with. And then same thing with distribution, putting stuff out there. I think the easiest ones to use are SoundCloud, Anchor, and Buzzsprout. Um, this is a slide from uh, a friend from Gimlet called uh, Rachel Ward. So I'm happy to share more about this later, but this is just sort of helpful to go, okay, maybe I could use my iPhone and um, edit the episode on Audacity. Um, so speaking of editing, I think editing is really huge and also something that people forget about when they're thinking about making a podcast. So you've developed your show idea, you've recorded some episodes, and then now, you have to go into your editing software and turn something maybe like an hour long episode or hour long recording into maybe 20 minutes. Um, so a helpful way of thinking about it that someone very early on in my career said to me was think of editing as like the, the audio you're working with, the interview you're working with is like a sculpture. And it's just in the beginning, it's like this hunk of marble and you're like, I can't see where David is in here or like, you know, a beautiful sculpture. It's just really hard to see any of the curves of that because it's just so thick. And you just sort of want to take the big stuff out first, like big chunks where you go on a digression or you get, these are really important questions. Where are you getting bored? Where are you getting irritated? Like you just want it to, you know, keep moving. Where are you getting confused? Like if you're listening to something and you're like, wait, what did I say there? Maybe that whole section needs to come out. And then slowly you're like chipping away and you got those big chunks out and you can sort of see the outlines of a, of a person or of an episode. And then you can kind of go in and do the fine detailing work of getting rid of ums and ahs. And um, if you're repeating yourself a bunch, and the ideas are just getting stale, you can take those out. But you wanna start with the big stuff because if you go in and you use like, you know, your huge tool first, and then also at the same time, you're trying to do the fine detailed stuff, you're just gonna get confused and your end result's gonna be, it's just gonna take you longer to get there. So I always like to just take off the big chunks first and then go in and, and sort of fine tune at the end. Um, and, you know, once you feel like it's in a place where maybe you've listened to it, a few times. I mean, I've listened to some episodes. I think I've been on like the V tens to V twenties, like in podcast production, we will sometimes go up to like V 20 on an episode or more. Um, probably not when you're getting started out, maybe you listen to it four times and you're like, I don't know what to cut it anymore. Invite your friends over, um, give them some snacks, watch them as they listen to it. That sounds really creepy, but we would do group edits at Gimlet where we would play an episode in front of everyone and you would see where someone yawned or like just got really bored or confused and like you would watch them like write down little notes and get a little bit nervous but it was helpful because you would make notes yourself and be like oh, okay well I thought that was really interesting but everyone's yawning so I should probably cut that section um and then talking about promotion so uh, again in podcasting in kind of professional production houses like Pushkin and Gimlet there's a whole team that does this. Um, we have marketing teams that literally their job is to get people on really big shows like Good Morning America, get in the New York Times, that sort of thing. Um, but if you're sort of working on a smaller scale, here are some ideas beyond sort of putting out a tweet and hoping it reaches people um, to get more listeners. I will say it's really hard to be discovered as a podcast still. It's discoverability is a whole issue with podcasting. People are really trying to 
fix it, but um, it's definitely still a problem. But you can do things like uh, swap ads. So you could basically make an ad uh, and put it on another show that has a similar audience size. So usually, I mean, when you're getting started out, you're not going to be able to swap a show ad with a uh, a Joe Rogan and say, hey, can you put my ad on your show? But um, you might be able to swap it with someone else who's sort of just getting started in the industry and say, hey, can I play an ad on your show? You can play an ad on mine. Let's share listenership. You know, you're doing a show about oat lattes and I'm doing one about pumpkin spice. Like I think our listenership would uh, have some crossover. Uh, you can pay for ads. Uh, don't ask me about how much it costs to, to buy an ad. I have no idea. That is not my expertise, but um, I know places like Spotify um, and even podcast discovery apps like Pocket Cast, you can buy ads on there. Um, you can appear on another show. So, hey, Oat Latte Show, can I come on your show and, and, and sort of do a story for your show. And sometimes people really want content for their shows. So they'll say, sure, that sounds nice. You, you're filling up some space and time for me. Um, I'll go, I'll, I'll let you do that. And you can sort of say, well, I, you know, I have this pumpkin spice latte show. I don't know why I chose this pumpkin spice latte metaphor. I guess it's on the mind. I used to drink a lot of them at uh, uh, UCLA. Um, and then asking guests who are on your show to promote. So if you're interviewing an, a big expert in the field, sort of after the show saying, hey, I would love it if you would share this with your audience, tell them you've been on the show. That can be a really great way. Um, and then sort of a final example, um, building an online community. So I actually did a lot of this when I was working at NPR. I, the first thing I did at NPR was not actually radio, it was doing social media. Um, and sort of online community building strategies for morning edition. I, I ended up liking radio much more and wanted to cut audio. And so um, told one of the guys there that I would teach him how to use Twitter if he taught me how to cut audio. But um, so I come from a background of, of online community building and there's this great show that used to exist called Note to Self, also from WNYC, again, um, shout out WNYC. And they did this amazing thing. It was a show about tech and um, how we use tech and how to sort of maybe use tech more mindfully. This was back, I guess, in like 2015, 2016. So sort of hot, hot topic of the time. And they did this show called, or they did this project called Bored and Brilliant. Um, and it was sort of weekly newsletter challenges of how to get more creative and not be so attached to your phone. And it, and it sort of started as a newsletter and they sort of grew an audience of people who, didn't necessarily listen to the podcast, but thought the newsletter challenge was really great because they would get these weekly challenges in their inbox. And then some of them transferred over to the podcast. And the even the newsletter challenge just got promoted by people because it was so awesome. And I think it's hard to sort of know how much of that converted, but I think they did track some of you know the signups and they found that people were coming to the podcast through the newsletter. So think about you know, where your audience potentially lives. Like if you're doing a pottery podcast, maybe your audience lives on Instagram and you want to focus on doing a really cool online project on Instagram and then uh, maybe getting some listeners through that. And then finally asking your listeners to rate and review. It's sort of weird because Apple is very much a black box about how this works, even, you know, Lots of different platforms are sort of a black box about how things get in the top 10. And there's much speculation in the podcasting world about how it all works. It's all an algorithm, who knows, but um, it does help to ask people to go online afterwards and, and uh, tell them and, and leave a review. And you can even say, if you review, take a screenshot and um, you know, in return, you can enter this raffle or give them some sort of incentive to actually go on and rate and review. So to uh, recap, great podcasts are made with lots of prep and planning. They are not made um, by just sitting in front of a screen and uh, recording off of the top of your noggin and, and, and not editing and putting it out there. I think Probably if you're coming to this um, presentation, you knew that already, but worth remembering that prep is really like where I, I think great podcasts are made. So putting a lot of time and effort into developing your show's style, tone, format, doing stuff like making a mock trailer, things like that before you even get down to record. Um, Experiment, think outside of traditional formats of doing a two-way style interview where you're just interviewing one person and, and chatting or doing a round table. 
think about game shows, think about advice shows, reality. Uh, reality stuff is really hard to do, I will say, but I think in podcasting, no one's done it well yet. So sort of the version of reality TV, but in podcast form, that is actually, um, to go back to the like red, yellow, green metaphor, a very red, red type of episode to do, but very cool. And if any of you end up making a reality show, I wanna hear it because I think it hasn't been done well yet. Um, Consistency is key. So setting up clear expectations, trying to do something on a rolling weekly basis is really great, or at least being really, really clear. It's coming out on the first Tuesday of the month and maybe naming your podcast first Tuesday of the month. So people remember to tune in while they do that laundry. And then uh, going back to that Ira Glass quote, you know, keep making stuff, keep making podcasts. It will get better with time. In the beginning, your taste level will be like, you know, if you listen to a lot of shows, you'll be like, why doesn't it sound beautiful and incredibly produced? And it's like, well, you're making it for the first time, probably. So um, you'll get into a rhythm, you know, maybe you'll make 250 or whatever, like me. And eventually after your 250th, you'll feel a little bit better. I still feel like I'm learning all the time about the stuff that I'm making and how I want to make shows and how I want to challenge myself. So um just remember to, to keep putting out stuff. And uh, yeah, so uh, a few resources if you wanna learn more and Maria's gonna send these as a uh, link, I think in the chat, but you can go to transom.org for more information about sort of the craft of podcasting. There's a lot of manifestos on there um, by big people in the podcasting industry. So like Starly Kine, Ira Glass, um, folks from NPR, they sort of talk about how they think about podcasting. Um, that's an online, that's an online sort of, uh, you can go on there and there's just like a million different links and a million different how-tos. And then there's a podcast, a podcast about how to make podcasts um, called How Sound. And that's basically the same thing, but in podcast form done by a different, a different uh, guy. I think it's finished, but there's like a whole archive of episodes that are really amazing. Um, there's also a book that's really awesome called Out on the Wire by Jessica Abel. She interviews primarily a lot of like this American life greats, but people from Radio Lab and all sorts of other um, podcasts. Um, if you're thinking about sort of adding music to your show, I really recommend Free Music Archive. It's really easy to find stuff in there that's uh, royalty free, which is really important when you're making something from scratch for the first time. You don't want to pay Ariana Grande for her songs because you, you won't be able to. We've tried. Um, and then for listening to podcasts, uh, Pocket Casts is a really great app for listening and discovery. It's just really easy to use. I recommend it more than Apple Podcasts or even Spotify, really. Um, although Spotify is cool because you can make playlists of episodes you really want to listen to. And that's really fun to do. But um, Pocket Cast is just my, just my personal favorite. Um, yeah, so I think we have like 15 minutes for a Q&A. If anyone has any questions. Um, hey, thank you so much. Um, I've learned a ton. So thank you so much for all of the advice um, and for all of the links. I just dropped them in the chat as well. We actually had a couple of great questions that came up. Um, so I'll just point a couple out to you um, and we'll try to make our way through them. Um, folks on the call, please feel free to keep dropping them in and we'll try to get to as many as we can. Um, but one of the first questions that came up is what is an ideal podcast length to keep people's interest? Mm, good question. Who is that from? So that is Gregory. from Gregory Cooper. Nice. Um, so I don't think there's any like one length. I think a podcast, I've listened to podcasts that have been an hour long that have been amazing and kept my interest like the whole, the whole way. Um, I think when you're getting started out making an hour long podcast and keeping it really interesting and spicy is very, very difficult. So I would say sort of depending on how many people you have working on the show, depending on experience level of producers you're working with, um, maybe keep it a little bit shorter. I love I love 20 minute shows, 20 minutes. You can make a little, little dinner. Um, you can hop on the subway from one place to the other. I just think it's a great, a great length, but you could even challenge yourself when you're getting started to make a five minute 
five minute podcast and people, you can keep people interested for five minutes. Like they're not going to lose interest if you do it well. Um, so I'd say it's, you know, I would aim if you're getting started 20 to 20 to 30 minutes, probably more on the 20 minute side, but I think, you know, if podcast, if the podcast is really well produced, you, it can, it can be an hour. I just haven't seen or heard many. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Kate. Uh, so we have a question from Toma, um, and uh, they'd love to hear about your thoughts on audio only podcasts versus podcasts that are offered as both audio and video. So pros, cons, differences. Um, there's a podcast that you can both watch on YouTube on the weekends. And it's just literally the host talking into a camera. Um, and you can also listen to it on Spotify. So pros, cons, and differences of audio only or audio and video. Nice. Um, that's cool. I don't have a ton of experience with sort of doing the recorded version of podcasts, but I do know that people are into them, which is really, which is really, which is really cool. Um, I guess the, I guess the con, not to immediately jump to a con, is if you're doing a video version, I don't video edit, but it's probably very hard to cut the video. So if you're trying to do a ton of cuts and really make it really tightly edited, um, cutting the video is probably going to be really tricky. What's so great about audio is like, you can do these little sneaky cuts in audio and no one would ever tell. Like when I started at NPR, I thought everybody sounded amazing just naturally, but like we edit so much of what people say, we get rid of their ums, our job is to make them sound amazing. So I think if you have a video version, maybe you just keep the video version really loose and unedited. And then the podcast version is a lot tighter. Um, but I don't know as much about video editing. I just know it's a little bit trickier to actually go in and edit those, but really cool that it exists on YouTube. And I know that actually Pushkin is trying to add more of our podcasts to YouTube to get a YouTube audience. Cause there's a lot of people who listen to stuff on YouTube, which we didn't realize. And then we were like, oh, people are just uploading Malcolm Gladwell's podcast episodes to YouTube. We should do that because people are doing it. So yeah, there might be like a cool audience opportunity there because it sounds like you listen. So there's probably other people who listen to or watch, I guess, on YouTube. Thanks, Kate. Um, speaking of editing, I have another question from Gregory. Um, he has a small podcast and uses Zoom to do the interviews. Um, what program would you suggest to use to edit the audio um, since it's not that easy on Zoom? And I know you named a few earlier in your presentation, but if you have any other advice on editing. Yeah, um, that's great. Thank you for the question. Um, I, I also use Zencaster. I don't know if there's a really easy way to, I don't know how expensive it is for people, but um, Pushkin uses Zencaster, which is kind of like Zoom, but uh, a little bit easier to like get people's audio levels um, nice before you even you know work with the audio. It sort of levels out the audio makes it a little bit easier to edit. So that's something you could look into as Zencaster. Um, it's spelled like you would think, but no E. So Z-E-N-C-A-S-T-R. Uh, um, and then for, for the audio itself, uh, I mean, I would make sure if you're doing a Zoom interview with someone, make sure that they're wearing headphones um, so that there's no echo on the other side. You're probably already doing that. And then for editing it, um, look into Odyssey. So that's on the slide. Um, even GarageBand uh, can work, but if you wanna get like one level higher, Hindenburg is a really awesome program. I think they sometimes have sales and it's it's like under a hundred a year to use and pretty, pretty awesome. And there's a lot of tutorials on that site, transom.org of how to use Hindenburg if you wanna teach yourself, but that's one step up. Awesome. Thanks. Um, another question. Is it possible to host a podcast on your own if you have some training in editing? Also from Gregory. And I'm just going um, kind of question by question. We have some other ones coming up. But again, uh, is it possible to host on your own? Yeah, absolutely. And I also don't think you necessarily even have to have like training in editing. I always say like everyone's an editor, like you listen to stuff all the time and you have opinions on whether it's good or not, or if it's, you know, boring. And you can even, like I said, ask your friends to listen for you and give you some notes, like your friends can serve as editors. Um, but yeah, it's definitely possible to host a podcast on your own. Um, the host of the show that I was mentioning the nod. So they actually had a show themselves. They were the hosts and they were the producers before they joined Gimlet. 
So they were like recording and editing everything. And even when they were at Gimlet, they were helping me to edit stuff. So totally possible to do both. I think a lot of people um, do. We have a question from Margaret. Is it possible to convert a blog into a podcast? Sure, why not? I mean, figure out like what it is about the blog that makes you want to turn it into a podcast. So going back to those initial sets of slides of like, okay, why is it that I want to do this in a podcast form? If my podcast is about, or if my blog is about, um, I don't know, uh, Margaret, I'm curious, like what the blog is that you're thinking of. I feel like you have a podcast idea in your mind, but like, think about what it is that you're not reaching in the blog world that you maybe want to reach in podcasting. Maybe you want to sort of have more of that casual one-on-one -on -one relationship with your listeners. Maybe, um, you want to be interviewing people, but have it be a little bit more lively than just putting like a Q and a on your website. Think about what element it is that you think is going to give your audience Oh, Star Trek episodes from an in-depth psychological perspective. Love this. We got some D and D people on here. We got some Star Trek people on here. Um, yeah. So think about like what it is about. Okay. So Star Trek. What's great about that in podcast form versus in blog form is potentially you can add little clips from Star Trek into the podcast. So when you're talking about that moment in Star Trek, you can like directly reference the moment in Star Trek. So the only thing to think about for that, um, thank you, Chelsea. Um, the only thing to think about for that is like, you don't want to play a super long um, recording from Star Trek. Um, <laughs> Lawrence, oh my gosh. Uh, you want to actually do like a sort of like maybe 10 to 30 second bit, because sometimes if you play too long, somebody who's listening might be like, wait, how long is this clip going to go and get a little bit lost? Also, there are some legal ramifications um, under fair use and not to get like really boring and legal on everyone, but you don't want to be pulling like, you know, a long five minute clip from Star Trek, which you wouldn't want to do anyway, but you just want to be careful about it. But I think that's great because it means like you can have people listen to the actual Star Trek episode and you don't have to like explain it in a blog and be like, and then he did this and this, like the person can actually listen to it and then you can comment on it. So um, totally. You should do that, Chelsea. Or sorry, Margaret. And Kate, a quick follow-up from Margaret too. So are short clips okay with fair use? Yeah. I mean, fair use is so tricky. Like we have a whole legal team at Pushkin that helps us decide what is fair use or not. But if you're just getting started with a podcast, and I don't know if any folks on here are actually part of the Daily Bruin, you might be able to ask somebody about sort of fair use in the Daily Bruin. Um, but I would say keeping under 30 seconds is a good is a good rule of thumb and then making sure that you're using it as commentary. So it, like it's usually okay if you're just commenting on this one scene in Star Trek and the and the clip is from that one scene specifically. So it, as long as it's commentary on the clip and you're keeping it pretty short under 30 seconds, it should be okay. But don't quote me on that cuz I'm not a lawyer. So Um, uh, let's see, we still have a few minutes, so please keep dropping any other questions in the chat while you have Kate. Um, Kate, I have a question. Uh, when you were first starting out with your first podcast, what was the most challenging thing and kind of the most redeeming thing, the thing that kept you going? What can uh, somebody just starting out look forward to? Hmm. I think the most challenging thing for me was like, I think the tech was a really, I'm not like a super techie person. So I just never thought that I would like get the technology of like cutting the audio. And it seemed like this really big barrier, but I think anyone can pick up audio editing. I really do. Um, I don't think you have to be a computer whiz or be a certain mind. Um, it just takes some patience and practice. Like at NPR, that guy I said, who helped me learn Barry shout out Barry. He's like, he'd been at morning edition for like 20 plus years. And he was so patient with me. He was like my like Zen master. Like it felt like I was in a star Wars movie to do a throwback to that. He would just like sit with me and he'd be like, don't look at the screen when you're trying to edit, feel the edit, like look away from the edit. Um, like it took me a long time to pick up the software. So I think, I think that's something to think about if you don't immediately take understand what's going on with the software that's okay like you know you can take classes there's pretty cheap classes on um 
lynda.com, um, L-Y-N-D-A.com. Um, I think they have classes on how to use like Pro Tools or Audacity or um, any sort of audio software, but a redeeming thing. I don't know, I've gotten to talk to so many cool people throughout my career. And it's funny what people will say on mic that they won't say like on screen or, um, I don't know, just people are really, when they're just on a microphone and it's just their voice, they just say, like say the funniest things and and you hear and you hear them do the funniest things and then you're editing their audio and they're like giggling and their bellies are making weird noises and um, they're just being very vulnerable and human. And it's just nice to like, sometimes I'll edit and I'll just be like laughing all over again, listening to an interaction. Um, and that's really fun. I feel like it's a very human, um, that sounds really weird, very human form, um, very vulnerable form. And I really like, I really like that. I think people open up in a way that they don't in other spaces, so. Awesome, thanks Kate. Uh, one more question came in. Um, so for, this is also from Gregory, uh, the two-person interview format, any advice on how to make a conversation more engaging? Yes, okay. Um, go in with a plan of, right, like where you're trying to go. Um, maybe have two people who are trying to convince each other of an argument. They're not just chatting about whatever. A podcast about donuts. Oh, Greg, do your podcast about donuts. Um, uh, yeah, I, and I think like you could play a game in the middle of the interview or at the end of the interview. Um, adding in clips or texture is really good. So again, if you're doing that, maybe you're doing an interview with someone about Star Trek, one of the writers, maybe inserting a clip in there to give it some texture would be really good. Um, and yeah, what else with two person interview? Keeping it really tight. Like I think people keep it a little loose sometimes with those conversations and go on too many dig digressions. You wanna keep in the digressions that like when you hear it again, really, really make you laugh. Um, like laugh out loud, but other than that, you know, keep it, keep it on point. Try not to go on too many tangents. Great tips. Thank you, Kate. So we are at time. Thank you so much um, for sharing all your knowledge. Again, I've learned a lot and thank you to all the participants for the great questions. Um, Kate, I know you have some uh, contact information on the screen here. Uh, do you want to share how folks can get in touch with you if they have um, other things to share? Yeah, absolutely. You, so you can follow me on Twitter. My DMs are open, as they say. Use them wisely. I'm at Kate E P M K A T. that's on there, E-E. PM. Um, and then my Gmail is on there. Um, feel free to reach out with me, reach out to me on there. Um, I'm really good if you send me like a specific question. If you ask me what I think about podcasting, I'll send you a link to this slide. But if you're like, I have a really specific question about X, Y, and Z, I will totally answer it. Um, so feel free to reach out to me on there and say that you um, came to the presentation and you have some follow-ups. I also, if you are a Daily Bruin student, um, very happy to give like resume um, advice, especially if you're looking to get into the podcasting industry, happy to listen to stuff. I listened to someone, a Daily Bruin student's um, draft podcast a couple of months ago, and it was really well done. And I was like, I didn't make anything like this when I was a student. This, you guys are like already 10 steps ahead. Um, so reach out, don't, don't hesitate. And thank you guys for all the great questions. Awesome, all right, thank you everyone. And thank you, Paul, for dropping another link about fair use. Uh, we're going to wrap it here. And thank you again, Kate. This was incredible. Thank you.